Greetings and welcome back to the broadcast. Today is Sunday, July 26th, 2015. I'm Sean and the website is truthfed.com. And uh, joining me again today, a special guest, Benjamin Baruch, is back with us. Uh, and he's here to talk to us about the Remnant Shall Return. Mr. Baruch, it's glad, I'm glad to have you back. It's an honor. Well, praise God, brother. It's really good to be with you today. And I very much enjoyed our first program. And and I'm also very blessed by your ministry, Sean. I wholeheartedly support what you're doing and pray God's blessing and His grace and His power be upon you and His blessing on your household for being a faithful witness in this last hour. Wow. Amen, yeah. brother. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the same to you, you know. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've been, I don't know if you've been noticing this, but something that's just really been bothering me is this I feel like there's a lot of attacks going back and forth between brothers and sisters and Jesus. I mean, have, have you been noticing that in the end times community here lately? Like people arguing over little petty things and it's just, it's really been bothering me because, you know, we're all in this war together in this last hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, many shall become offended in this last time and, and, uh, shall hate one another and betray one another. And there's a spirit of offense that has just been released yeah. upon the nation and upon the, the church. And, you know, it's uh, it's really kind of terrible, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> God didn't call us to argue with one another. You know, he commanded us to love one another. and uh, But yet, um, there, that doesn't seem to be what's happening out there. Yeah. Yeah, I... I don't know. I, you know, I think the devil's just hard at work, and uh, especially against those of us who are kind of on to what's going on, and and it's easy to have strife stirred up. And um, but anyway, I just wanted to I just wanted to ask you if if you've noticed the same thing as well, and if you've been bothered by it. Um, yeah, I've seen it in spades, brother. I mean, every false accusation you could imagine has come forth out of the body of people that profess to be believers. Um, I mean, I've seen crazy stuff, you know, people, you know, remembering the exact opposite of events and, you know, people just passing on rumor and, you know, false reports and, you know, they hear it, so it must be true, you know. Right. Even though the scripture says, you know, two or more witnesses are required in order to confirm something is true, you know, people, uh, I don't know, they, they seem to have their minds, you know, more open to the negative and, and to, you know, yeah, to the critical spirit in, uh, you know, the, the, the Lord told us, you know, in Isaiah, you fast for strife and for debate, you know, and, um, and again, in, in Romans, you know, Paul wrote and he said, you know, God gave these people over to a reprobate mind, the people that didn't retain the knowledge of God in their hearts. People get, that walked in the knowledge of good and evil and not the knowledge of God, God gave them over, and they were filled with all unrighteousness. And in the list is, you know, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. There's the prosperity gospel, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate. Hmm. What? Debate is on the list with murder and. Yeah deceit and whisperers, and, you know, this word for debate, it means a contention to quarrel and to strive and to debate, you know. Yeah. We don't need to be a good debater to enter the kingdom, you know. The Lord never called us to strive with each other, you know, and that's not a character trait that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's really the, the work of the flesh, and, and yet, um, you know, it, it's everywhere. People arguing and you know, they've got their own dogma and, you know, all these different sects. Everybody's got their own teaching from the Scripture. And, you know, much of it just came out of the knowledge of good and evil. I was sharing an email with a, a friend today, and and um, I mentioned to him, you know, the number 23 is the number of death. And um, he wrote me back and said, how do we know that 23 is the number of death? Well, you know, the Scripture tells us that... Uh, you know, I'll read you the verse um, in 1 Corinthians 10.8. You know, 
let us not commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000. Again, in numbers, you know, Nadab and Abihu died when they offered strange fire before the Lord, and those that were with them were numbered 23,000. You know, 23 is the number of death, and, and the number 22 is the number of truth. You know, the number 22 represents the 22 characters of the Hebrew alphabet, and all truth is revealed through the Hebrew scriptures, and yet the number 23 is is death. And, you know, well, how does that work? Well, Sean, if you add anything to the truth of God, you add things to the word of the Lord, you get death. Mm-hmm. You don't get more light. You know, when we take the word of the Lord and we use our knowledge of good and evil under the dark counsel of this ruined age, and we say, therefore, and then we start building doctrines, based on our personal understanding of the Scripture, we always bring error. And then we get dogmatic because we're so convinced we're right, and, you know, and we're so full of ourselves that we end up being full of pride. Yeah. We're, we're completely unteachable. And then, you know, then the easiest thing to do is to become offended one with another. Mm. Yet the Scripture says in the Psalms, they that love thy word, nothing shall offend them. So if we find ourselves being offended, we need to look at whatever it was, because the very things that offend us are things that are sort of a reflection of areas in our own lives that are not yet consecrated. Yes. But yeah, it's out there, brother. I mean, and why we would all be fighting with each other is beyond me. I mean, we, we do have a real enemy, you know, and it's not our brothers and sisters in the faith. It's the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of wickedness. It's the mystery of iniquity, and it's everything that came right out of the kingdom of Satan. That's the enemy that we should be fighting, not our brothers and sisters that maybe have a slightly different conviction, you know, about right. the things of the Lord. You know, we're, we, we all have slightly different convictions, and that's fine. You know, Paul said, hey, some people are, you know, un- they've got a conviction that they shouldn't eat meat. And, you know, Paul said, well, don't let your faith stumble your brother. If you're with them, you know, then you show grace to them and don't eat meat in front of them. Yeah. You might have freedom, but, you know, don't use your freedom as a cause to offend or stumble your brother because, you know, the, the Lord said, Woe unto you if you stumble even one of the little ones that believe in me. You know, and people are running around. I mean, you know, we, we don't see the log in our own eye, Sean, but we see the speck in our neighbor's eye so clearly. And so everybody's carrying these, like, telephone poles on their shoulders. Hmm. trying to pull the specks out of each other's eyes, and we're banging each other with these logs. And it's a big log jam out there, brother. Hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. what's going on. It's a yeah. mess. Yeah, and that's a good word. You know, um, one thing I've known, and we're all, we all have the tendency sometimes, because we're in the flesh, you know, we're in this human body that's fallen. Um, but I've, I've noticed personally that, you know, if I, if I'm, if I hear something that I don't agree with, uh, uh, you know, a, a doctrine or whatever, or, you know, somebody saying to do this or not do this. Most of the time, if I'm like upset about it, it's usually related to my own pride and to what I think I know, or you know what I mean? Exactly. And, and I have to look in the mirror and say, you know what, you know, Corinthians says, if you think you know something, you know nothing at all. And uh, so I have to check myself as well. But, you know, uh, the last thing I would do is go to, like, uh, another brother's website or another brother's podcast or YouTube channel or whatever it is and and just start attacking them. And I just see that in the community, and it's heartbreaking. And uh, so I don't know why that came to mind, uh, but you gave a good word for it. uh, So I appreciate uh, your insight on that. Um, Well, people get so divisive over the, you know, the issues of Bible prophecy as well. Oh, yeah. You know, Sean, we were told in the scriptures, that the book of Daniel was sealed up until the very end of time. Absolutely. That's in Daniel. Yep. Daniel himself did not understand the prophetic word that he wrote by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and he inquired of the angel that had come to speak with him, and he was told, Go your way, Daniel, for these words have been sealed up until the end of time. So over the next 2,500 years, Students and teachers of the scriptures all tried to discern and read the sealed book of Daniel. And they all formulated an understanding based on their own knowledge 
mm-hmm. which is really, if we're using the carnal knowledge, the knowledge of our human mind, we're using the knowledge of good and evil. And in our knowledge of good and evil, Sean, we judge ourselves good. We judge our neighbor evil if he disagrees with us. Yeah. And yet, you know, the truth is really the opposite. To the extent we're judging and condemning each other, we, mm-hmm. we really have areas in our own lives that are not yet redeemed. And, <clears throat> you know, people, people will call each other heretics just because they have a slightly different view of prophecy. Yeah. You know, one camp thinks that we're going to all be raptured before the tribulation. Right. It's a pretty widely held view in America. All right, you mm-hmm. know, that's their thinking. Yep. They're entitled to their opinion. You know, it's not what I read in the scriptures. I don't find any support for it whatsoever. But yet, men believe these things. But then they'll proceed to call someone who doesn't hold a preacher of view, people that maybe are a pre-wrath, or people that think that rapture could be maybe even at the last trumpet, mm-hmm. they call them heretics. Well, your understanding of prophecy is not a cardinal doctrine of the faith. You're only a heretic if you deny the cardinal doctrines, sure. such as the deity of Jesus and the, the power of his atonement on the cross, which is the sacrifice by which our sins were covered, and through which we can be born again by the power of the Spirit. But, you know, we're not born again by our knowledge of good and evil. We're just made into Pharisees. And the truth is, Sean, that this is a time of a great falling away. You know, it says in the Scriptures that before the end of the age, there would be a great apostasy. And that word, means, we get the word apostasy from it. It means to fall from the truth. And so, you know, this is the hour in which there's been this great falling away. Mm-hmm. And it's manifesting everywhere. And yet, you know, in, in the midst of this, people are just, they're dogmatic, they're argumentative, and they've heard nothing from the Lord. There's an entire camp within Christendom that teaches that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the miracles of God, and even the, the Lord speaking directly to his people all stopped with the book of Acts. Right. And it all ceased. Well, there's no authority for that. The book of Joel says your sons and daughters will prophesy at the end. There's two witnesses coming who are going to prophesy to the nations. So, you know, the Scripture yeah. teaches, no, um, it hasn't ceased. You know, but these doctrines were formulated by the people who've lived their entire lives in the outer court. They themselves have never heard from the Lord. So they say, therefore, no man can hear from the Lord. Mm-hmm. Because that's their personal experience. But they're building their doctrines based on their own understanding and based on their personal experience. These teachings are not based on the Word of God. They're based on men reading something in the Bible and then saying, therefore. And so we're adding things to the Word of God, and in so doing we introduce error. And that's how all the deceptions of the enemy, I mean, in the last days, men would no longer endure sound doctrine. People can't even bear to hear the truth today, brother. Yeah. But instead they turn to fables, to things that were made up in the imagination of the minds of men. Mm-hmm. And they read fables. The most popular book on Bible prophecy was the Left Behind series. Yep. And it was fiction. Yeah. It was a fable. It's a make-believe story. Yep. And yet that's what everybody read. Sixty-something million copies of that book. Oh, yeah. I, I read through them. I, you know, because I want to say those came out, what, like 2000, 15, 16 years ago? And I, right. I read through them. And... Because at the time I was a young Christian and I wasn't grounded in the Word, uh, you know, I just kind of went with whatever teacher it was tickling my ear at the time. And, uh, you know, I read through those books and I was reading it thinking, oh, this is exactly how it's going to play out. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, and what we really need to do is stop reading this stuff and go right to the Word of God. What does God say is going to happen? What does He exactly. say it's going to look like? And uh, I want to get your, th- your thoughts on this while we're on the topic, and then we'll get into your uh, book here, The Remnant Shall Return. But one thing that I do see a lot, and I've been talking to my audience a little bit about, is there's a lot of people out there, YouTube, uh, you name it, writing blog posts, doing radio shows. They claim to be hearing from the God, and I be- or hearing from God, and I believe a lot of them are. But there's all these mixed messages. Uh, yeah. As an example, let's just go with the, the rapture topic. You know, uh, you, 
you believe that the scriptures are saying, that's ah, probably not right. It's probably not, you know, boom, you're gone. And then all the trouble comes. Uh, some people say, well, it's right before God pulls out his wrath. You know, I'm hearing from the Lord. I'm having this dream. I'm having this vision. Some people say, no, it's not till the end. And, you know, right. we all kind of fall into one of those camps. But then I, my frustration and a lot of people's frustration is, okay, well, who's actually hearing from God? And how are we supposed to know? Because we've got hundreds of opinions and we're all falling all over the place on this, on this, just this subject, much less, you know, some of the others that are out there. So what's going on in your mind? I mean, why, why all the mixed messages? And a lot of these people, Ben, they're, they're godly men and women. They, they have a heart to serve Christ. They're just trying to warn and get the message out there, but there's a different message coming from each one of them. Well, the ultimate authority is the Word of God. Yeah. And any teaching that contradicts the Scripture is false. Right. And here's the standard that we must use. The Word of God is the absolute truth. And the Word of God is true in every way, and it is true in every day. So if, you, if you've heard some teaching that requires a part of the Scripture to be false in any way or on any day, that teaching is not the truth. Because... Scriptures are always the truth. And it's the teaching of men that are in error. You know, the, the prophet Jeremiah spoke of the last days. You know, one of the great deceptions in the, the book, the, the Remnant Shall Return, the very first topic that it addresses is this relevance of the prophecies of the Bible. The prophets of God, who were they? Jeremiah was a prophet of the Lord, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Malachi, the rest of the minor prophets, Daniel, these are the prophets of God. They're the true prophets. We know they've heard from the Lord. And yet, every one of them spoke to their generation. Mm -hmm. If you read the book of Jeremiah, he spoke to Judah before the destruction of Babylon came upon the nation. Right. And yet, the prophecies of Jeremiah also speak of the end of the age yep. and what will come upon the people of God at the end of time. And that includes the Gentile church. And yet much of the Gentile church reads the Bible thinking, oh, that's all the Old Testament, and therefore doesn't apply to us. Well, that's one of the errors. The Old Testament, and the word for testament means covenant, the Old Covenant was repealed. It was canceled. The Levitical priesthood was canceled. God fired the Levitical priesthood. He canceled the Old Covenant, and he replaced it with a new covenant, which was made with Israel, under which we could be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit and through faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we could begin to do the will of the Father through the power of the Spirit, not following the Torah commandments of God through the knowledge of our flesh. And if you want the truth, Jesus raised the bar. The commandments mm -hmm. of God said, thou shalt not murder. The Lord said, you shall not hate. The Ten Commandments said, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus said, you shall not have lust in your heart. So the Lord raised the bar under the New Covenant to an even higher level of holiness, not just outward obedience, but obedience and holiness in the heart. But yet, in this last day, one of the deceptions that the enemy came in is, and they said, well, you know, the Old Testament doesn't apply to the Gentile Church. Well, the Old Testament is merely the Old Covenant. It's not the prophetic writings. This piece of paper that's in our Bible between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew that says the New Testament, okay, that's, that much is true. The New Testament writings are the commentary on the New Covenant, and they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. They are every much the Word of God as the entire Bible. But the Bible, at the time of the Apostles, was the, what you call today the Old Testament. There should be a piece of paper in our Bibles in front of the book of Isaiah that says the writings of the prophets of God. And the writings of the prophets of God have not been canceled, as has the Old Covenant. There should be a piece of paper in front of the Psalms that says the books of wisdom 
and the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and if you can receive it, the book of Job mm-hmm. is also one of the books of wisdom. The books of wisdom have not been canceled. The Psalms are still the Word of God and very much applicable to all of our lives, as are the Proverbs, as are all the holy writings. But the Old Covenant has been canceled. And anyone who tries to go back and and enter into covenant with God under the Old Covenant is going to go nowhere in the Spirit. Because, Father, God doesn't recognize the Old Covenant. It has been put away, and there's a new covenant that has come. And thank God, because in the power of our flesh, none of us could fulfill the requirements of the Old Covenant. No. We all fell short. No. Because you had to do them perfectly every single day. You know, it's like you're driving your car on a long interstate trip. I was driving today for several hours, and I'm dutifully trying to do the speed limit, right? <laughs> but all of a sudden, for one moment, I look down and I'm doing 70, 75 miles an hour in a 65. How easy is that to do? Oh, yeah. And I could get a ticket. Here, I drove for four hours. I drove the speed limit for three hours and 59 minutes, and I speeded for one minute. I could have gotten a ticket. I didn't, but I could have. And it doesn't matter that I drove the speed limit for three hours and 59 minutes. That's no defense having speeded for 30 seconds. That's all you need to do. And under the Old Covenant, it was the same. You could keep the law of God perfectly every day of your life and then have one day where you missed. Now you're guilty of the whole law. Yeah. And so God had to replace the Old Covenant because all it ultimately did was convict us and condemn us and ultimately kill us. And, you know, the truth be told, brother, nobody was ever saved by the Old Covenant. They weren't. No. Nope. They were saved by faith in God's promise of salvation, and that promise became a reality in the life of the Messiah. We yeah. got saved through Jesus. We didn't get saved by keeping the law. Right. And yet, the modern church has, you know, this mindset, well, that's the Old Testament, it doesn't apply to us Gentiles, you know, we're a separate group of people. No, we're not. God has one kingdom, true Israel. Israel means ruled by God. The people that are actually ruled by the Lord, they are the people of God. The people whose God is the Lord are the people of God. And the people whose God is their bellies, or the people whose God is the gods of this ruined age, the gods of pride and the gods of money and the gods of power, these people aren't the people of God. They're the people of the world. And yet many of them come in Jesus' name. Jesus warned us. He said, many will come in my name in this time and deceive many. And boy, have they come, and they're on TV, and they write books, and they claim to hear from their God. But they haven't heard from the real Lord. And, you know, in in the book of Malachi, the scripture says, you know, Behold, I will send my messenger. This is the promise of the coming of Elijah. And we know that in the first coming of Jesus, John the Baptist fulfilled this prophecy. He himself was not Elijah, but he came in the office of Elijah. And Jesus even told us, if you can receive it, John is the coming of Elijah. Right. The apostles were amazed, but yet it was true. And he came with the exact same ministry Jesus had in the first coming. He came preaching repentance, and he came baptizing the people, which is teshuvah in the Hebrew, and it means to, to surrender your old life and to be washed and cleansed in the waters of renewal, and to be renewed in a new life, to, to make a new commitment to serve the Lord. And that was the ministry of John the Baptist, and he, he made the people ready to hear the teachings of Messiah. But yet, one such as Elijah, one who comes in the office of Elijah, is indeed coming again. And we read about this prophecy in Malachi 3, and the scripture says, Behold, that means, in Hebrew it's hene, it means look, see, pay attention. This is important, what is about to be told to you. Behold, I will send my messenger. The messenger of God is coming, and he will prepare the way for me. This time it's a different ministry than the ministry that John has. And the Lord whom you seek, everybody's waiting for the Lord. He shall suddenly come. The Lord's going to come suddenly. That much is true. But look where he comes. To his temple. What temple? Even the messenger of the covenant. The temple, the new creation of the the born-again believer whose life has been sanctified. Not just saved and justified legally, but also cleansed and sanctified. And, you know, that's where the church kind of missed it. 
Much of the church has stopped at the teaching of salvation. They don't know anything about the teaching of sanctification. And so they all loiter in the outer court on Sunday, where you can't hear the Lord outside his house. If you want to speak with the Lord, you must enter into the inner court. You can't hear the Lord in the outer court. If all you've done in your Christian life is gather together on Sunday or whatever day, and you gather together in the outer court, which is where the mixed multitude comes, and this is the people that are still walking with garments that are defiled. They haven't cleaned their feet. They haven't washed their garments. They live their lives outside the temple in the world. And then they come unto the house of the Lord, into the outer court, and praise God, yes, of course, come. But understand that in the outer court, you can't hear the Lord. The Lord sends his teachers and his prophets, and he sends his ministers into the outer court to teach the word of God. But the dogs have come in as well. The church didn't know to lock the door. They let the dogs come among us. There was no discernment in the church. And, brother, I was there at the beginning of the Jesus movement. I got saved by the Lord in 1971, and somebody told me I could meet Jesus, and I thought, wow, that really would be great. And I did meet him in a profound way, and I walked with the Lord, and, and I talked with the Lord every day. And I actually, when I read my Bible and it said, my sheep hear my voice, I thought, they sure do. But I had come within in order to enter into the inner court, you've got to wash yourself at the lather, the large water basin. You've got to clean your hearts, you double-minded. Then you have to approach the altar of sacrifice. You've got to present your life a living sacrifice. And you don't get to keep your sin if you want to enter into the house of the Lord. You've got to humble yourself. You can't walk in there in your pride. God will not let you inside his house if your life is covered in pride. And pride... Go search this out. Pride is the number one abomination in Scripture. The Lord lists the sins that are abominations before him. And one of them is murdering innocent children. But the top of the list is pride. And why would that be? Because pride is the strong man of Satan's arsenal against humanity. Because when we're lifted up in pride, our minds are blinded. And we start following our own ways. We're doing what's right in our eyes. And you know, we formulate our own understanding of the Scripture. You know, I talk to these people and they tell me, well, I've read the entire Bible. Oh, did you really? <laughs> Which version of the Bible did you read? Did you read the one in the flesh with the knowledge of good and evil? Or did you read the Bible with, that was filled with the Holy Spirit and you could hear the Rima voice of God speaking? Which set of Scriptures have you read? you study it like the men? Or do you study it like the high priest of God, whose mind is filled with the mind of Christ, it's an entirely different book. Mm -hmm. There's people that read the Bible that get nothing out of it, because they can't hear the voice of the Lord. And yet, you know, th these deceptions have come. The Lord is about to suddenly come in his temple. And what does it say about this time? Behold, he shall come, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Oh, the Lord's about to come suddenly, and he's coming in the messengers of the covenant. And who can stand when he appears? For it's going to be like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and God's going to clean his house. And the people don't know that. They think we're all fine. Everybody in the outer court thinks they're fine, and many of them are just waiting for the big by and by. And they assume, you know, nothing bad can happen to us. Look at the last 2,000 years of church history. Yeah. Christians have been getting martyred for 2,000 years. The church was born in martyrdom. They were throwing Christians to the lions in Rome. Nero was burning them as torches for his banquets. Yes. Well, you know, the church has been through these fires before, and yet this last day's generation thinks somehow, you know, we're going to escape all this stuff and get to keep our sin. Well, yeah, Benjamin, Benjamin, uh, look what's going on right now in the Middle East and Africa and other parts of the world. Some of the largest Christian persecution in history is taking place right now, and some of the Absolutely. most brutal. And I've made this point. Look, I believe that I do subscribe that Jesus could come back at any moment. I do believe in a rapture. But I don't believe 
that we should have an attitude as of, well, we don't have to care about any... And you and I talked about this last time, the need to pray for those people, the need to, to fast for those people, and the disgust right. I have for, the, for ignoring that. And, and it's almost like, I can't believe that the Western church has the audacity, the arrogance, to, to think to themselves, who cares about that? We will never have to face that type of persecution. That attitude is a sure is a, is is basically a, a sealing your own grave for, for that to come upon you because God hates pride. You're, yeah. That's right. Conti- go ahead and continue. I just it just frustrates me. And like I said, I believe in a rapture. I believe Jesus would come back at any moment. But let's not let's not be so foolish and so arrogant well, to think that we're just going to escape every little problem in this world. Well, the Lord is. He's the authority on these things. Exactly. I mean, Jesus knows more about his Bible, which, by the way, he is the Word of God, right? Exactly. So he wrote this book. And so the Lord knows more about the Word of God than any man ever. And the Lord warned us. He said, pray without ceasing that you be counted worthy. Yes. What? What? I thought as a believer we were all automatically worthy. No. Once you're a believer and you've been saved, now you're justified. Mm -hmm. Your sins have been forgiven. You're not going to hell. But God is going to work His holiness in your life. And if we don't cooperate with the Lord, the Lord doesn't force His will on us. He takes us through the experiences of this life where we reap what we sowed, and we find out our own inventions were worthless. Mm -hmm. We get to a point where we finally decide we want the will of God, because we've seen nothing else works. You can't go follow your own way and end up winning. It doesn't work. If it did, you'd end up in hell. That's what the wicked do. They're following their own way, and they're satisfied. The old wine is good enough. The Lord doesn't confront them. He just lets them go. And they run into hell for eternity. But when you're born again, and you've been adopted by Father God, now you're his child, and he visits your transgression with the rod of judgment. And he won't let your way work because he's trying to bring us to repentance, where we repent of this self-will that is running riot, Mm -hmm. and we finally humble ourselves, and we learn to walk with him. We learn to walk in the leading of the Holy Spirit, not after the leading of the flesh. And yet, Sean, the truth is today, the Holy Spirit has left many congregations. Mm. And, you know, but the people have continued on. And now another spirit has come in. A counterfeit spirit has come. There's a counterfeit anointing. There's a book called uh, The Kundalini Anointing. There's also a great YouTube on the World Revival Satanic Church, or maybe it's the World Satanic Revival, all about the false church that's operating in this false spirit. You know, and this is people that at one time, you know, maybe they were spirit-filled. Maybe they really had a touch from the Lord. But they did not want to obey the Lord. And so they went their own way. But they still wanted to gather together and have church and have a spirit come upon them. So a strong delusion was cast down. And another spirit, a a counterfeit, it's the spirit of Janice and Jambres, which confronted Moses. And that spirit counterfeited the first few works that Moses did. It was able to turn a rod into a serpent as well. Mm-hmm. So it looks and acts like the Holy Spirit, but it's not the Lord. Yeah. It came right out of hell. Now, how terrible is that? Christian church full of demons? Brother, I saw the very beginning of this myself back in the late 70s. I went to a Christian youth concert, and I had been in an incredible anointing in the very presence of God for an entire weekend at the end of which the Lord was speaking audibly throughout this weekend to me and three other people, and at the end of which the Lord spoke to us and said, I want you to pray that I remove my anointing from you, for I'm sending you back to my church, and they cannot receive you in my presence. Hmm. And I'll be perfectly honest, I was not really excited about this. 
but we obeyed the Lord. I, mean, I liked being in the presence of God. I didn't want to leave, but I was going to be sent back to the church, and I couldn't go in the presence of God. And so we prayed. I was with one of the brothers from the weekend, and Sean, we felt seven waves of the Holy Spirit lift off of us. And, I mean, it was so, it was so profound. And, and that's where we're all going, is into the presence of God. And the Lord himself is going to suddenly come in our presence in the lives of these anointed ones who are the messengers of the covenant. But brother, after this, after this anointing lifted, I got home and the Lord told me, I want you to go to the Christian concert at church tonight. And when I went, this Christian youth band started playing the new version of Jesus Rock and Roll. And Sean, with my eyes, I saw thousands of demons fly up out of the stage and fill the auditorium like a huge canopy of darkness, and all the evil spirits were flying in this big circular canopy. It was nothing but darkness. I mean, the devils were, I don't know, 20 feet thick. There's thousands of them flying over the people, and the church was just sort of clapping their hands and having a good time in the flesh. I don't know if anyone else discerned the evil that had come in, but I'm, make, I'm waging war in the spirit. And that was the late 70s, brother, and this was a spirit-filled church. This was a church that had witnessed powerful moves of God. But now this new form of worship had come in, and with it, the darkness. And none of the leadership apparently even noticed. And that was the late 70s, brother. Yeah. Now, that really happened. You know, some people might dismiss me and say, you know, I'm making these things up. I'm not telling lies. My witness is faithful and true. And so this false worship came in, and, and it opened the door to the darkness and to compromise. And then after the false worship came the false prophets. The whole false prophetic movement exploded in the 80s. And with the false prophets came the false teachings and the doctrines of devils. And the great falling away began. And then came a false anointing. And all that's left is a false messiah and a false prophet from hell that are going to soon be revealed. But, you know, the Scripture tells us these errors in the last days. And, Sean, one of the teachings in Scripture is dealing with the deception of the last days is in Jeremiah 23. And I'll just read a few of the verses. I would ask our listeners, go and read Jeremiah 23 carefully and prayerfully. Let me walk you through some of it. It starts out with a warning to the pastors and the teachers. Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter my sheep, says the Lord. And when God warns us with woe, this is serious business. You do not want the woe of the Lord coming upon you. It is more intense than anything you've ever experienced. Most believers have never seen what the Lord's talking about when he says woe unto the teachers that have destroyed my sheep. And God goes on and he, and he says that I will gather the remnant of my flock. And that's what my new, the new volume three is all about, is the God gathering the remnant out of all the countries where I've driven them. And I'll bring them again to their faults, and they'll be fruitful. And I'll set up shepherds over them that shall feed them. Not these imposters, these hirelings that have come to make merchandise of the truth and to make a fortune off the teachings of Jesus. These guys are counterfeiters. The Lord's going to send real shepherds. In verse 9, Jeremiah 23, and, you know, the number 23 is the number of death, and this is the death that came within the kingdom. Verse 9, which is iniquity, the number of iniquities, and the number 9. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets, all the prophets that have come into this generation. Jeremiah's heart was breaking, and all my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man, and a man who's been overcome because of the Lord and because of his word of holiness. There's no holiness anymore in the church. Well, there may be legalism. There's different sects that are trying to walk after the knowledge of good and evil, and you know they're dogmatically following their doctrine, Sean, <laughs> and they'll kill you with it. But it's not the holiness of the Lord. The holiness of the Lord comes filled with the fruit of the Spirit with peace and love and joy, not this dogmatic, accusing legalism. That's just another one of the deceptions. It's not the holiness of the Lord. For the land is full of adulterers, and because of swearing the land mourns, 
The pleasant places are dried up. And the anointing from on high has dried up in many congregations. For their course is evil. Their way is evil. People are doing what's right in their own eyes, but the way they're going is evil. And their force is not right. What is motivating them is not the spirit of God, but it's the spirit of men. It's the spirit of mammon. It's the spirit of idolatry. It's the spirit of rebellion. It's the spirit of pride. Believe me, whatever you do out of those spirits is contaminated. It doesn't even matter if you teach in the Word of God. If it's coming forth out of a spirit of pride, it's coming from the other side. And it goes on, it says, both prophet and priest are profane. There is literally a a compromise that has come to the point that the people have become defiled. In my house I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Hey, I, I found the wickedness when the false worship came in on the, the church filled with devils. That's pretty wicked. I would say that was wickedness in the house of the Lord. We don't need the church full of devils. The church is supposed to be filled with angels and filled with the Holy Spirit, not demons. Therefore their way shall be slippery unto them in darkness, and they'll be driven on. Now this, this evil that's come within, these false spirits have come, they're driving the people, like the butchers driving the goats to the slaughterhouse. And I'll bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation. Oh, the Lord's suddenly coming, all right, but it's going to be a real surprise to many. And he, he goes on in verse 14, I've seen also the prophets of Jerusalem, a horrible thing. They commit adultery, and they walk in lies. The people are lying. Oh, God told me someone's going to give me $1,000 tonight. No, God didn't. They simply lied. Verse 16, Thus says the Lord, Hearken not, do not listen to the voice of the prophets who prophesy unto you, for they make you vain, and they speak visions out of their own heart, and not from the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto a nation that despises me, the false prophets are talking to people who despise God. Oh, they honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from the Lord. And they despise the commandment of God because they disregard the word of God. They do whatever is right in their own eyes, not according to the commandment of the Lord. And they say unto a nation that despises me, the Lord has said, you will have peace. That's what the false prophets bring, a false prophecy of peace and prosperity. And they say unto everyone that walks after the imagination of their own heart, no evil will come upon you. The people are not walking after the Spirit of God. They're walking according to the imagination of their own mind, and they're being told no evil will come upon you. You'll never see the day of evil because you're not going to be here. And who, then the scripture says, but who has stood in the counsel of the Lord? and has perceived and heard the word of the Lord. Who has marked his word? That means able to underline the right scriptures, the proper scriptures for this hour. Who has marked the word of God and heard the ream of voice of God speaking out of the scriptures? And then the scripture tells us what's coming. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is going forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind, and it will fall grievously upon the head of the wicked, and the anger of the Lord... The fury of the Lord will not return until he has executed and until he's performed the thoughts of his heart. And in the last days, you're going to see this for what it is. The scripture says in the latter days, you'll consider or understand this perfectly. This is a last day's prophecy that at the end of time, in the last days, as the books were being unsealed, the pastors would be teaching lies to the people, there would be compromise throughout the church, there would be false spirits working in many assemblies, the land would be dried up, the pleasant places would be mourning, because the course of the people, the way that they're going is not right. And yet they would be told that peace was coming, and they would never see the day of evil. The false teachers, and these false teachings would come, and give the people false comfort, and would be telling the people, the day of evil is never coming upon you, you're never going to see it, you're all going to just disappear here any day now. And yet, that teaching is so utterly false, because in Matthew 24, Jesus told us before the abomination of desolation, which is the beginning of the Great Tribulation, you will be hated of all nations on account of my name. They will hate you, persecute you, and kill you. Worldwide persecution is coming before the Great Tribulation even begins. And yet, this church that's walking in their... They're following the imagination of their own hearts. They don't hear from the Lord. There are entire churches that teach no man can hear from the Lord. Where do they get that from? 
On what authority can they say that no one can hear from the Lord? Hmm. They made this up. It's out of the imagination of their own minds, based on their own experience. They've never heard from the Lord. Obviously, God can't talk to anybody. If he doesn't talk to me, I'm the most important person on the planet, he certainly can't talk to you. I've had people literally tell me this, Sean, in so many words. I've never heard from the Lord, therefore you can't either. Well, the Lord says he knows the proud from far off. If you're walking in pride, you're not going to hear from the Lord. He also says he's close to the brokenhearted. When we finally humble ourselves and God sends his afflictions, and he sends the trials, and he sends the tribulation into our life, and it finally breaks our heart, and then he shows us our sin for what it really is, and then our heart really breaks within us. We finally humble ourselves, and now we're brokenhearted. The Lord draws close to us in that time. He says, I'm close to the brokenhearted, but I know the proud from far off. But the people that are full of themselves, and that's this generation, brother. Yes. This is a generation that is full of themselves. And the Lord said, I am going to empty them out. He didn't say, I'm going to rapture them into the clouds. He said, I'm going to empty them out. You know, and the fastest, the, the easiest way for us to cooperate with the Lord in this process, Sean, is to be fasting and praying. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I've had to learn the hard way. <laughs> and it's, it's unfortunate, but it, it's true. Um, you know, when, when, these, when these things come in, it's into your life, and you know that God's shaping you, and it's hard. I've learned, because I've had to do this so many times now, that it's best to just learn. You know what I, you know what I mean? It's best to just learn it, and instead of trying to avoid it or escape it. You know what I mean? When God brings that, when God brings that uh, I guess I'd call it discipline into your life. Well, you know, we were, the Lord taught us this in the, in the prophetic writings, and, and I'll read you, this is just out of, from the Out of the Darkness, Volume 1. Has he smitten us as he smote those who smote us? Are we slain according to the slaughter of them that have slain us? In measure, when it shoots forth, you will debate with it, but he stays the rough wind in the day of the east wind. And by this shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all of the fruit to take away our sin when we make the stones of our altars as chalk stones. When we burn our high places, we tear down our graven images, and we beat them asunder, and the groves and the images shall no longer stand up. The Lord is talking about purging his people through affliction. He smites us. He afflicts us if we belong to him. And the word in Hebrew is nakah, and it means to wound or to punish, to literally strike. God smites us. But does he smite us as severely as he will one day smite those who have wounded us? No. He merely judges us in measure. Does he judge us the same as he judges the world? No. He judges us with mercy. He afflicts us in measure only. And when he brings his affliction on his people, it is measured out perfectly. He doesn't do this willingly. He only does it for our good to purge us and purify us. And he does this in order to bring us to righteousness. And yet look what the scripture says, and you will debate with it. Hmm. That's what we do. You know, when initially God brings his affliction in our life, the scripture tells us, despise not the discipline of the Lord, but our first reaction is to debate, to argue, to try to get out of the fire and run from the pain. And that's what's going on in a lot of people's lives. And, you know, we want to stop it. We don't want the Lord to do the work. We just want the pain to stop. Yeah. But the Scripture tells us, despise not the discipline of the Lord. When the Lord sends affliction in our lives, complaining, debating, pleading, rebuking are of no profit at all, and actually they make it a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you don't receive God's correction for what it is, you will not respond correctly, and rather you'll be entering into rebellion and adding sin to sin. And then the scripture continues, by this shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. But then it goes on and it says, yet the defensed cities shall become desolate. If we try to defend ourselves from God's judgment, we'll bring desolation upon ourselves like the wilderness, and we'll become the branches that are just dried up, withered up, and consumed. In the process of God afflicting us, when he brings his judgment into our life, and he judges every son and daughter that he receives, if we don't receive his judgment for what it is, if we don't receive his correction, 
if we try to defend ourselves, will bring nothing but desolation upon our lives. If you wrestle with the Lord when He's bringing His correction in your life, if you debate with Him, if you complain and fight against the discipline of the Lord, you're going to wither up spiritually. And, you know, that is essentially what the Great Tribulation is for, is for God to bring the purging and cleansing that is necessary to get us ready for the wedding feast. First, there must come a time of actual mourning for our sin unto true repentance, and only then can the light of the morning come, which is filled with joy. And, you know, but that's just not the teaching of this last day's Laodicean church. You know, they're rich, they need nothing, you know, nobody hears from the Lord, that, that all stopped with the time of the apostles, and, you know, we're all going to disappear before any trouble comes. Mm-hmm. And yet the trouble's already here. Exactly. Yeah, the problem, the judgment's already begun. Yeah, people, people keep waiting around, Benjamin, for that, like, that, that day. They're like, well, I know judgment's coming eventually. And no, it's here, it's been here, you're living in it, and it's about to get worse, but the judgment already started, you know? Oh, uh, oh indeed it did. Yeah. I mean, the judgment, the judgment of God is outlined in Ezekiel chapter 14. When a nation sins grievously against the Lord, so much so that its land becomes defiled, and that's the United States today. We have murdered 50 million babies. Mm-hmm. We poured their blood down our sewers. Yes. The blood of innocent babies is underneath all of our cities, and it's crying out in the Spirit. God can hear the cry of all the innocent life that's been slaughtered, so much so the land of America is now defiled by the grievous sins of this nation. And the Scripture outlines the judgment sequence of God when the nation has defiled itself. The first judgment is on the staff of bread on the economy. That already started in 2008. The next judgment is wild beasts shall enter the land to rob it of children and so that no man may pass through it. And the word for wild beast translates an evil company of men. Evil troops are coming, and they're going to put the land under martial law, and they're going to take the children from some of the people. And no one will be able to pass through freely because there'll be checkpoints everywhere. And that's the persecution of the, upon the people itself. When the evil troops come, now the judgment's coming upon the people. But the purpose is to turn us to righteousness. And a righteous remnant is going to be delivered from this judgment, purified through it, and then delivered from it. Some of us will be martyred, and then we will be raised from the dead, and we will receive a crown of righteousness for having been faithful unto the Lord. And martyrdom is is actually something that was common in the early church. Jesus was martyred for our sins. All All the apostles, save John, were martyred. And there will be martyrs in our generation. And we don't stay dead. We get raised from the dead, and we're going to heaven. We are not the people in trouble. The church is all freaking out about the hard times that are ahead. But God, when he brings the hard times in our life... He does so in measure. We're never going to see the judgment that the wicked see. We are never going to have the wrath of God upon us. Oh, he he will use the rod. And we may even get to drink from the cup of astonishment. The cup may come around to a few of the people that are really high and mighty in their own eyes. And you may even get to taste the dregs thereof. And that'll really change your tune quickly. It will bring you to the end of yourself. And in that place where we come to the end of ourselves, Sean, that's where we finally repent from the core of our being. And, you know, the sword that is coming is going to pierce our hearts all the way to the core. But when it's finally done its work, we will repent from the bottom of our hearts. And in that place of total repentance, the Lord is going to pour out the Holy Spirit. And we're going to go from the most difficult trial that any of us have ever seen into a place of such holy repentance and then an anointing from on high. The Lord's going to pour out the living water and in the midst of a world going out of control, He's going to fill His people with peace. You know, we have nothing to fear from what is coming. We must learn the fear of the Lord. 
And the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. And we have, this is a nation turned over to evil, and within it is a church that has been compromised by evil. I mean, the demons came in in the form of false worship, and the people loved it. They didn't know the difference between the sacred and the satanic. How is this possible? Well, they'd already fallen from the matters of the heart that are required to actually walk with the Lord. You know, they believe in him, they know his name, maybe many of them are even saved, but they're still walking in that outer court, and so they lack the discernment of the Holy Spirit. They couldn't tell these were false prophets that came. They couldn't tell these were counterfeit ministries on all these, you know, Christian syndicated TV programs, where all they want is your money. You know, it's as if the whole New Covenant is just about getting out your checkbook. It has nothing to do with the New Covenant. And yeah, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, but the New Covenant is about repentance and, and doing the will of God. And the Scripture says it is a curse to give to the rich. And yet that's where all the money went, to these rich, you know, guys that have got 35,000 square foot houses and private jets. And, you know, and it's all about, you know, getting a seed offering. And what a bunch of garbage. You know, the Lord never said that if you give to him, he'll make you rich. He said, if you give to the poor, you're lending to God. It's in the scriptures. If you give to help widows and orphans, the Lord says, you can count it as a loan to me, and I will pay you back. He didn't say you would get rich. He said he would pay you back. That's all. And if the truth be known, you get paid twice. In this life, the Lord pays you back. And then in the kingdom to come, you also have a reward for eternity. So in effect, you get to double your money, if you want to look at it that way. Now, I'm sure the hypercritical will just suddenly start scoffing me. That was a term, you know, like just a figure of, of identity. You've got to be blessed twice for having obeyed the Lord and shown mercy to the poor. You know, Sean, right now a lot of people are worrying about how do we prepare for what's coming. Mm -hmm. There's no way to prepare in the natural. It's impossible. You cannot prepare for the day of the Lord in which the end of all flesh shall come through the preparation of the flesh. The end of flesh is coming. Preparing in the flesh will avail you nothing. You must prepare by the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying don't, you know, have some food saved up, or don't do this, or don't do that. All I'm saying is if you're doing it through the mind of the flesh, you're wasting your time and money. If you're not being led by the Spirit of God, what are you doing? You know, we've got to get it right with the Lord. And then, whatever the Lord leads you to do, do. And, you know, quite candidly, what's coming is beyond our comprehension. We have no idea how it's going to affect our own neighborhood and our own lives. Mm -hmm. And we have no idea, you know, what to do about it. This is the time of perplexity in the Scripture. And the reason it's a time of perplexity is people are unable to hear from the Lord. I mean, brother, I've been all over the country preaching and teaching, and I've spoken to thousands of believers who've woken up to the fact that, you know, the book of Revelation is about to occur, and the day of the Lord is about to begin, and they're all freaked out, Sean, you know, mm -hmm. because they can't hear from the Lord. Right. And so they're in a panic. What do I do? Well, you know, what we need to do is what the Lord said to do. Go back to the book of Joel. There's a bunch of instructions. Gather together in solemn assemblies. Lie and weep before the altar. Fast and pray. A solemn assembly is where you gather together with a handful of people and you confess your sins one to another. Your own sins, your family's sins, your generational sins, the sins of your nation, the sins of this apostate church. And when we confess our sins one to another, our pride does not survive. We can only be proud as long as we've hidden our sin. And you know, the game of hiding your sin really was... Most people were content to keep playing that game as long as that game was working. Sean, in the lives of the remnant, God's not going to let that game work. He's bringing that game to an end. We can't hide our sin anymore. And the Lord will bring us to the point where we've got to get rid of it. You know, and that's what the wilderness journey is all about. The Lord brings you to a place where it's either repent or die, people. Now, if you belong to the Lord, you're not going to lose your salvation, just your head. <laughs> You know, and the Lord says in the Scriptures, you know, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. This is a nation of people that do not fear the Lord. But the knowledge of the fear of the Lord is coming, brother. And it'll be here within the first five minutes of the Great Tribulation. Right. 
<laughs> instantaneously, we will all get this incredible education. This revelation is coming out of heaven that we should have greatly feared the Lord. Right. But we don't. We walk in presumption, and we walk in pride, and we follow the teachings of the imagination of men. And then we're so full of ourselves, we're not even open to the correction of the Lord. And yeah. So, you know, what's left? The sword. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's really not a place for people like us uh, in the church anymore, Ben. I mean, as far as, I mean, not as far as hearing what we have to say. No. You know, I, I don't have, I mean, in my own community... I don't have any Christian circles that I can really be in and say what's true and say what's coming and say, you know, it's like truth has been completely rejected. And like you said, all this false teaching that's been going on for 30 years or 40 years is, is right. now the new Bible instead of the actual word of God. Well, it, br- brother, it's actually getting worse because now we have this thing called the emergent church where they dismiss the Scriptures entirely. You know, in the Scriptures, the Apostle John said, you know, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I watched a beast emerge out of the sea. And with it came an emerging church. Brother, they don't even know the Lord. I mean, the Laodicean church at least belongs to Jesus. He's standing outside, knocking on the door. There are His people inside that church. And He wants to save us. But this emergent church, most of these people don't even know the Lord. I was watching a, there's a YouTube called Church of Tares, and at one point in it, a pastor, a woman pastor in the emergent church, was a guest speaker at some main denominational congregation, and she stood up and she said, I am a practicing Wiccan, which means I am a practicing witch. And I worship the goddess, which I believe is the ant or part of God. Here, this lady told this group she was a practicing witch, and she worships another deity. Sean, this whole church full of people just sat there and didn't even react. They continued to let her teach. I mean, it's ridiculous. When when they're so bold to come forward and tell you that they're actually witches and warlocks that have come among us. Folks, leave. You know, write Ichabod on the door on your way out the door and don't come back. And, you know, this revival, this, this satanic revival that's in the world today and this false anointing, I was invited to one of these revival services by some baby Christians that I knew. And they wanted to go and so they you know, asked me to go and I went with them. Next to me in the church pew were two women, and before the service we started talking, they introduced themselves to me as Mormon witches. We did not get along at all. And at one point, they said to me, well, you're no brother of ours. And I said, well, that's the first thing you've said that is true tonight. I am certainly not your brother, and you are certainly not of my company. Because they were practicing witches. Sean, when the false revival anointing was you know, they did the, this mayhem revival, the epileptic revival, the barking dog revival, you know, the, the people going into, you know, Kundalini contortion revival, the falling down backwards revival. And the Bible says God's friends fall on his face, but his enemies fall backwards. You know, go search it out. Everywhere in Scripture, when the men of God fell in the presence of God or under the power of God, they always fall on their face before the Lord, at the feet of the Lord. But his enemies, they all fall backwards. And so this false revival, these two witches, they went forward, brother, and one on either side at the front of the church, they began spinning in circles, and they had their hands held out, and Sean, I could see into the spirit world, they were channeling demons into the room. That's the terrible time that has come. You know, I, I share with you, you know, your perplexity of what to do, because... I've heard from the Lord. He's revealed to me the sealed scriptures. I see what's in the Word of God, the real Word of God. And I try to talk to the leadership of the church. Man, they look at me like a cow looks at a new gate. Mm -hmm. They don't even comprehend. You know, I can explain the scriptures for them, but I cannot understand the Word of God for them. 
And they're so entrenched in the dogma of this final apostasy, you know, and the deceptions are layer upon layer of deception, that they just can't even hear the word of the Lord anymore. Yeah. They perceive it not. So what do we do? Go out and preach in the wilderness, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we're at. You know, uh, something that I've been talking to my audience about a lot lately, you know, I, th- I mentioned earlier, you know, all the different opinions and all the YouTube, because here's basically how I spend my, a majority of my time. You know, I watch a bunch of videos and listen to a bunch of podcasts about the end times because I'm obsessed with the Lord and I want to know everything I can know, you know, right. but there's all these mixed messages. And a lot of the people who follow this channel, they're following a bunch of other stuff as well. And so what I've been well, telling people is, you know what? I think it's time to start backing off of all these teachers and get to the real che- teacher, which is Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Mah- Yeshua HaMashiach, and read that book and dive into those scriptures and get the real answers instead of being led by men who have all kinds of different opinions. Well, you know, the, one of the things that's in the, the new Search of the Scriptures book, the last chapter is called The Search of the Fathers, and it's, it's all about searching out the Father's the patriarchs of the faith, and and ultimately the differences in the worldview between the Greek world, the Hellenist world, and the worldview of the fathers, the patriarchs of the faith, which was really a Hebraic worldview. And, and Sean, to boil it down, the Gentile, the Greek worldview, which was known as Hellenism, is a worldview in which knowledge is the highest good. Yeah. You know, the ultimate aspiration of the goyim is knowledge. And so that's the model of last day's Christianity. You know, the guy that knows the most about the Bible, he's the pastor. He stands up on Sunday in the big podium under the lights, and he shares knowledge with the people. But he's not a father to the flock. The enemy can come in and steal half the people during the week. They don't care. Nobody goes looking for the people that are lost. It's like, oh, well... They just keep sharing their knowledge. But the Hebraic view was relationship with God was the highest good. It wasn't the knowledge of good and evil, but it was a relationship to actually know the Lord, not just know about His Word. And to really know the Word of God, you must have the Holy Spirit so that you could hear the voice of the Lord. Because, Sean, you can twist the Scriptures to mean anything you want them to mean. I mean, all the cults that are out there, they all read the Bible. All the false prophets, they have a Bible in their hand. Satan himself came preaching, quoting the Bible to Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, just the fact somebody's got a Bible doesn't mean they're of the Lord. They've got to have the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you don't have my Spirit, then you're none of mine. That's the distinguishing difference between the many who only know his name and the remnant that are being saved. The remnant have been born again by the power of the Spirit of God. You know, the many who are not saved, and believe me, they, be- they think they're saved, Sean. The, of the many, the Lord said, these are they who have never received my character, and they've never been changed by my words, and they never learned to walk in my ways. They just pick and choose which Bible verses they want to believe in, and You know, they interpret everything according to their own experience. They do whatever's right in their eyes, and nobody's there to tell them otherwise. And they they comfort themselves with the vast numbers that are on the same wide road with them. Hmm. But that will be no comfort when they get to the end of the road. Yeah. And so, you know, the Lord's calling out to his people, Sean, I'm working on a new book right now, and man, the Lord keeps me busy. I'm, I'm doing a new book. And I'm actually doing it with another author who's an expert on Russia and the Soviet system and on Soviet strategy. And we haven't decided a title yet. We're kind of debating whether we want to call it The Road to World War III, Reflections in the Final Days of Peace, or maybe The Path to World War III, Reflections in the Last Days of America, or perhaps just The Last Days of America, But it's all about the deception of the Soviet system and the detailed plans that the the Russian and the Chinese military have basically developed in what will become 
World War III, which is the Battle of Ezekiel 38. And, you know, the American people are completely oblivious that there's a war coming. They're oblivious that China and Russia are still our enemies. They're oblivious to reality, and, you know, and they're focusing on just a bunch of disinformation or taking down the Confederate flag is not a national issue. I mean, great, it's, you know, probably a good idea. That's a racist symbol to the lunatic fringe, so fine, you know, put it in a museum. I could care less either way. The real issues that are facing our country are not even being looked at. Yeah. Instead, we're talking about transgender, and we're talking about, you know, nonsense. Well, the American people are hopelessly deceived about the geopolitical balance of power, and this book is going to be an eye-opener. For people who would say, well, how could the United States ever be judged? Well, we'll explain it to you precisely. But, you know, the same people that have been deceived politically into thinking this red-blue debate is even relevant, and there's no difference. It's the same ice cream store. You're, just, you're buying from the same vendor, the same poison, whether you want the blueberry or the raspberry version. It's the same lie at the end of the day. These same people also can't discern the truth scripturally, yeah. spiritually. And they're being deceived by all. You know, and there's, there's 31 versions of counterfeit Christianity out there. And, you know, how do you know the difference? You search it out in the scriptures, and you prayerfully search it out through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the discernment that comes from the Lord. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're utterly incapable of figuring it out. Yeah. Unless you cry out and ask the Lord for help, you'll never figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Good words. Oh, man. Benjamin, I, I'm convinced we could do this for the next six hours. <laughs> um, we're well, well over. <laughs> you normally do a, like a one hour show, is that? Yeah. Kinda? Yeah, we're just a little over. We're only 15 minutes over, so that's not a big deal. Okay. Uh, but, man, it, there's, there's just so much going on and, and so much to talk about. And I, I guess just uh, to close it out for the. Uh, what, just if you can. What what advice do you have for everyone listening? You know, they they want to be part of the remnant. They don't want to be part of this, you know, this group of people who's completely oblivious. They want to be in the will of God. They want to make you know Jesus their headship. They want to be yoked to Christ and go down the narrow path. You know, what can they do? What you know? Let's, what's what's something practical that they can actually start doing so they can start to get right with God? Well. We, we need to come out of Babylon. We need to recognize that many of us have been asleep spiritually, and we're sleeping in Sodom and Gomorrah. So we need to wake up, and we need to recognize that we've got to come out and be separate. You can't keep the demonic entertainment in your house. You've got to get the cursed articles out of your house. So you need to prayerfully go through your house, and you know if you've got the satanic rock and roll collection, burn it. Destroy it. Get rid of it. And, you know, if you're watching the satanic entertainment of this hour, you know, turn away from it. And then we need to seek the Lord with all of our hearts. And the antidote for this deception is the Word of God. But the power for the breakthrough comes through prayer and fasting. And, um, you know, to, to seek the Lord with all your heart. I mean, that's all we really can do. Yeah. And find the, the, the teachers who are teaching the truth, because the truth is out there. You know, the truth is in the wilderness today. It's not in the mega churches. You know, this I would not be invited to speak in most mega churches. Yep. They would throw me out. I mean, you know, they have thrown me out. <laughs> Literally, I've been physically thrown out of the building <laughs> in a couple of churches. Because I dared to say that the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom. I got thrown out for quoting scripture. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. You read the Bible and they throw you out of the church. Well, that tells you everything you need to know about that church. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, great advice, you know, coming out of Babylon. And, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You, you said it perfectly, Benjamin. Um, your website is benjaminbjork.net, and I'll have it pulled up for people so they can see it. They can pick up your book there as well, or if you yep. want, you can send me a link that you would like them to specifically use, and I'll put that in the show notes for everybody to see. Um, and then, so that's for The Remnant Shall Return. And then when you get your other one out and ready, uh, you, if you want to come on here and, and 
tell us the information about World War III and all that, I'd love to have you back on, and I'm sure the audience would be thrilled to have well, you on. Well, you know what? Well. Maybe we should do another show to get into the details of the, the sure. Remnant Shall Return. Sure, yeah. Because there's some pretty awesome stuff. I mean, the essence of this book is all about the recognition that there is a remnant, they're going to be returning to the Lord and the land, and when you start looking into what the Scriptures are actually saying about this hour, look, if we get our lives right with the Lord, we're going to be okay. Right. And the Lord is a good God. He really is. He's wonderful. He's very insistent, though, about this issue of sin. Right. God demands that the sin come out of our lives. But if we cooperate with the Lord, the Lord is gracious and merciful, and He doesn't turn away anyone. Right. So, you know, it's incumbent upon us to find the truth and find the Lord, and then we're, we're actually going to be fine. It'll be very well with the remnant in this time that is ahead. There's no need for the remnant to be afraid. They're going to be fine. Right. Well, you know, I'll probably just label this one the day, or, um, the remnant shall return part one, and then I'll get with you in the near future to do part two. Does that sound okay, good? Okay, great. All right. Awesome. All right. All right, brother. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. God bless you, Benjamin. Keep doing what you're doing, and... Uh, yeah, I'll get in contact with the email. We'll, we'll get back to this as, as soon as possible. I really, really appreciate your time. Hey, you're welcome. It's always a blessing. It's good to be with you again. And, uh, yeah, give me a, a call or whatever, and we'll go to the next step. Thanks, Sean. All right. God bless.